Kia ora everybody. Um, and thank you for the invite. I really appreciated the um, presentations that we've had this morning. I just want to add a couple of things. Um, the evidence base that Bridget speaks about, that ev evidence base is pretty rock solid. Uh, I just want to speak about the acuity of what's happening on the ground at the moment. So um, Fitunaki is the largest um, child and adolescent mental health service in the country. Uh, and we're kind of like in a red light zone. What does that mean? It means that normally we might have 25, 30 referrals that we've got in this fancy thing called a whiteboard. It's an electronic record keeping mechanism to tell us who's needing to um, access service. As of sort of Monday, Tuesday of this week, we had a sort of emergency meeting where we had 157 young people on that board. And that's just beyond anything that we can logistically manage. So I just want to mention about acuity. Not all of those children are going to be um, children that have experienced trauma, but I can say that a large percentage of those children will be. Um, and so in relation to being able to um, meet the complex comorbidities that exist within trauma, so if you think about the younger the child, you know, we see hyperactive, impulsive behaviours that sort of meet the criteria of ADHD, but really um, those behaviours are, are a result of trauma, and yet the treatment for that uh, can make a big difference to the well-being and state of the child. We have a number of children that actually, um, as a result of trauma and other sort of deprived circumstances, their intellectual and cognitive functioning is well, is, is much lower than it could be or should be. And often we see with appropriate care, often um, kids' psychometric testing improves. So, but that, that type of testing, um, the resource to do that, the number of clinical psychologists, for example, to be able to do that very specific type of work that can then sort of add um, a deeper understanding of what the child and family are experiencing from a clinical point of view. That's quite sophisticated work, yet the system's overwhelmed. So we've got to figure out how we can get that expertise available to the sector in a um, more effective, more efficient way. Um, and, and problem solving around that is really complex. I just wanted to finally add that um, when it comes to working with these children, there are micro and macro things that you've got to do well. So we had a really traumatised uh, young woman in our um, service yesterday and things were going really, really well and you know, we had a couple of professionals come in and just, just the, how complex and how difficult the young person's situation was meant that they said things unwittingly that were, um, if you think very carefully about how you should approach that situation, sometimes in the moment all of us as professionals say and do things that are re-traumatising. Really um, and that's an issue of education, that's an issue of training, it's an issue of supervision of, 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 of all of us as we go about trying to do what is really complex work. And I'll stop now because I've got a sense that people want to ask questions and there's so much that needs to be said in this um, space. So any, any questions that you'd like to ask and um, direct them to an individual or to the whole panel? Who'd like to start? There's somebody here. Yeah. There's a mic on the way. Thank you. Um, Andrew Zielinski from the um, multi-agency family violence team. Um, so I, I was interested in the, I took the point, I think, I don't know, you might have made it originally, Bridget and Julie, you, you had it up there too. The most effective um, services are directed to the child um, and the other non-abusive parent. Um, so we know that perpetrator-based services are lacking what does that what does that mean for us sort of addressing those services when that's the sort of key evidence we we're sort of presenting? I um, certainly through um, our experience developing the family solutions, we've um, taken a very very steady learning approach, so that um, each funnel that hand that's come to us, we've really reflected on what are the needs that are being. Um, illustrated here. We're quite fortunate, if, we're, if there is through um, the assessment information gathering process um, a real recognition that there is um, services needed for the um, other parent, carer, perpetrator, then there's family violence services, we will have good connections with our other community groups. So I can think at the top of my head in Wanganui the, there's a memorandum of understanding between the two agencies and we will cross refer over and be part, the other agency will be part of the conversations and the information sharing because as community NGOs what we are really good at is working together effectively and using the resources across the agencies 
um, to ensure that the services meet the needs that are being. We can't do everything for, you know, we're not skilled in everything. So if we work together effectively and collaborate, then we're able to bring in services to meet that individual family's okay. needs. But the, the services need to be out there, don't absolutely. they? Absolutely, absolutely. I challenge that, that's okay. Um, I think that um, in the Pacific and probably Māori space, um, and, and it's kind of true with Asian community as well, we find that um, the majority of Pacific women return to the, the perpetrator of violence. So if we don't think about intervening or interventions that are f effective for the perpetrator, and the majority of them are men, then I think in our context, we're going to underserve our community. And so despite um, the strong evidence behind Bridget's research, I just think that you know, a missing part that we have to take seriously is the, the violence perpetrated by the men. And there's probably one good program that's running at the moment. Um, Massey University is doing a research program around peer support. So men that have um, experienced family violence have done um, a number of programs themselves and have come through the other side and are no longer uh, violent partners. Um, so that peer support program uh, is showing really, really good results so far. It's still in its very earlier stages. Um, and it's really cost effective. So peer peer support is, in my view, a really fantastic model. Um, it occurs um, in the languages and with all the cultural nuance that, you know, if somebody is from a particular culture <coughs> and they come through the other side. And I, I, I think that a lot of the professional power that comes from the experts holding a lot of the expertise, I think that if we're really going to access a wider group of people that need our services, we've got to reorientate our thinking. Uh, kia ora koutou, McGannon from Wellington Sexual Abuse Help Foundation. Um, I'm just thinking about, um, you talked about psychotherapy for the children and the non-abusive um, parent and parenting programs and um, I've worked as a child therapist and also as a facilitator for parenting programs and one of my big concerns um, doing the Incredible Years program was people who would cycle, recycle, parents recycling through that program and often not getting their own psychotherapy. So when we're talking about intergenerational transmission of violence and the impacts of colonisation, that not being addressed for those individual parents and them going through programs coming out feeling like failures because they theoretically knew how to parent but their limbic systems are so fired that they just go back to what they learnt um, or what's been transmitted to, through to them. So I'm wondering what people think about more availability of psychotherapy for parents. Um, As a Polynesian, I'm really concerned about the attachment that occurs through psychotherapy with tra traumatised um, families, and then um, you know sessions are paid for. You might have eight, twelve, sixteen sessions. You've formed a really deep connection with a human being and that family, and then the funding model says that they have to move on. That particular therapist has to move on, and in traumatised children, traumatised family, that's a really traumatic experience. In my experience. Uh, and the other thing that I'd like to say is the quality of psychotherapy. So um, if you think about um, quality, um, our methods for monitoring quality are very, very poor. So um, when, when psychotherapy is done well, the, the benefit, the potential benefit is enormous for the, for the children and for the families. When psychotherapy is done poorly, then um, we're in big trouble as a sector and that family's in big trouble. We don't have a method for supervising the quality of therapy that occurs in our sector. And that, that, that bothers me a lot, it, it bothers me a lot. And I think at an individual level, working alongside our colleagues in South Auckland, I know who's good and who's not. Um, and that just comes from intimacy, working in a small community over a long, well, County's not a small community, but if you've been there 25 years of, of working there, it becomes small because we're actually a small sector. So I'm really concerned about the re-traumatisation of psychotherapy when it stops, and I'm really concerned about poor psychotherapy. Um, yeah, I guess I was reflecting upon the um, current primary mental health um, investment model that we've we've got set up in our primary care settings, where um, a number of you know if you belong to this doctor, you can access six CBT sessions, and that is the limitation, um, give or take a, a slight um, you know you you might be able to find a loophole there somewhere, but generally, you know we, we're being prescribed. 
um, what is good for us when actually we're not all the same. Um, so I think that we, once again, we don't, the way that we fund um, enabling psychotherapies and um, therapeutic interventions for people is not sophisticated enough. And I think, again, we have an opportunity to go, okay, well, what's the remit of, of how we need to respond to people in, in their time of need? And what are the, the, the multiplicity of mediums and um, options that we can draw upon to do that? For, for example, I don't think it needs to be just that we sit in front of a therapist as an individual working through my stuff. Why can't I come in with my um, cousin and my uncle and my brother for whom we've got stuff that we need to work through? And do we need to talk about just my stuff or do we talk about just you know, the, the, the transactional processes between us and how we come together and how we move forward as a whānau? Mm -hmm. So, kia ora. And I'd just like to add from a, an NGO perspective, um, the, the funding model in terms of change would be, a re the, to change the funding model would be a real opportunity in not only health but in um, social care provision. So predominantly um, we would have been traditionally funded for um, a unit which is 10 hours. So we would be referred from traditionally child youth and family or and now Oranga Tamariki one family for 10 hours, which you haven't even built, had a real opportunity for whānau and children to give trust and start to have a real sense that they want to share and want to work with you for, in 10 hours. So where we've been really fortunate with the family solutions model has been and um, working that they've changed the unit model for us. There's not a... Um, more money, it's just a different unit set up so we can work for up to a year. So on average we're doing 40 to 50 hours. That's a really effective way of changing money to do things, you know, the money's not the same but the amount we can invest into one family is significant. Um, morning, I'm Sue from Bernardo's. One of my questions is actually that use of the word psychotherapy within the caveat because psychotherapy is a huge range of therapies. It's a um, not very well understood term in a lot of places and is it actually doing us a favour to put it all under psychotherapy? Should we not be using words like therapeutic interventions because we actually could be pushing our providers down a way of investing huge amounts in training and resources for what they think is psychotherapy, which may be not actually what we mean. Mm -hmm. So it's just the use of the word psychotherapy is such an overarching term is quite confusing. Yeah, I completely agree. So, um, yeah, perhaps therapeutic interventions is a better term. Um, what I found within that psychotherapy bracket is that, of, as we know, most commonly the evidence for CBT types of psychotherapy is much stronger, and, but it also includes other things like art therapy, play therapy, and in those cases the evidence was, again, still much stronger than for psychoeducation or advocacy, and the effects are still beneficial, but, again, not as strong as for CBT. Hi, Ross, uh, Ross McCracken, joining Good Arts Community Social Worker. Um, I'd just be really interested in the panel's um, view because I've been working um, uh, 16, 17 years with children, young people, families, um, and in the majority of my work, when you strip away the layers and get down to the bottom with, the, with children, young people, family violence is very prominent in, in most stories. Um, but I think it's the language that we use around family violence is quite a, is a, is a barrier to achieving change. And I know, for example, like the, the police and now in their, in their training have switched more to like talking about family harm to sort of better encompass it. But then if we just talk about family harm, we don't acknowledge the violence and, the, you know, where people actually end up dead through, this, the, through family violence. So I think, and I think it is quite a barrier in terms of use just, and we're all sitting now talking about family violence. And I think as professionals, we fully understand what we mean. But for general, the general public and people generally, oh, but I didn't see any violence. I didn't, you know, that was, there was yelling and shouting and, the, you know, we know that all the emotional harm, which has been said, can actually be worse than the actual physical side of it from a child's perspective. So just, yeah, just interested in the panel's perspective on that. I think, because I think we need to change in how we talk about this. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Ross. Um, one of the things that I came across in the research was that uh, parents' perceptions of what children are exposed to is much lower than what they are actually exposed to. And so, yeah, I think that's a big limitation. And the language, I agree, I s struggled with you know, 
when a child's exposed to family violence, they're, they're still a victim, but in order to distinguish that from a direct or primary victim, is not really doing justice to what they're experiencing as well. So yeah, I, there's some things we need to work out there. Yeah. Perhaps on an individual basis is where the language becomes important when you're working one-on-one -on -one with someone, what's the term that works for them? I don't know. I think the, um, from my perspective, the learning is how we, um, as you've highlighted, illustrate the words. So in conversations talking about the harm that's caused by A, B and C and the impact that can have on children. So it is changing the language to capture what we actually mean and how we can then have the conversation about what needs to change to make a difference and what interventions need to. Because um, for me, and this is just a personal view, family violence sounds stable as if that's the position um, rather than um, that's the experience and how, what do we need to do to change the harm that's been caused there, to make it more fluid. Um, and I think the, uh, my observations would be there would be a, a more engaging conversation. Uh, kia ora, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I completely agree with you that I think we need to be talking about family harm and all of its um, uh, myriads of presentation. Um, we, you know, we're talking about violence as as an act, but um, for some of our young people, um, they are as as adversely affected by a complete lack of parenting, for example, and non-presence. So, I th and and again, I would call that family harm. So, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to total call your sentiments there, Kia ora. This is a um, question for you, Bridget, here in Beetson from Oranga Tamariki. I was interested in your comments about safety planning and looking at in a broader, more preventative context. Um, are you able to talk about that at all? Um, so what I came across was that it's it's just a, a really key example, I think, of how it's something that looks like it should help, and if, particularly when you're limited to, say, 10 sessions, it's something that we can do in that time, probably. But when it's in isolation, the risk is that that, back, that intent backfires because, yeah, it focuses the child on this is going to keep happening, here's what you need to do to prepare for it, rather than acknowledging what's happened and working to heal that as well. Um, yeah, I wonder if you guys can answer that. Yeah, I really enjoy um, safety planning with the staff that come from um, Oranga Tamariki. Um, because, and with families, the part that I enjoy is um, if, you, if, you, if you can make sense of what's going on for a family and you can articulate that really well, to an extent that maybe the penny drops, then the, the plan itself becomes uh, an extension of that deep appreciation for what's going on. And you've got to get to that point. And so you've got to, you know, sometimes we have a crisis where we've got a family for 45 minutes for an hour and some really complex things are going on. Um, and we're forced into a situation of writing um, a safety plan when really we haven't been able to do our due diligence to understand sufficiently deeply what's truly going on for that individual and their family so we can make sense of it alongside them because when they make sense of it you don't need a piece of paper and really that you know our, our task is to make sense of really complex things for families because they're just too close to what's going on and their emotions are running too high and given our neutrality we're what we one step back and if we do our jobs well it's kind of magic to watch when we don't do our jobs well the plans don't stack up uh, and I would um, affirm that as being what I call hard conversations, to listening to the story, listening to people's feelings coming through, what the impact has been, and then having the, the skill to, in a sensitive but really truthful way, saying it as it is and what needs to change. And that way we will really work in a child-focused manner to ensure that people have an opportunity to really understand what the impact is and have a conversation with the adults about what needs to change because of what. And I think that's a real skill to have those hard conversations but those open and honest conversations and I agree people, that, that you can see the penny drop. It's like a door has opened and people can then start to think, okay, I can do this and now I understand what it is. Now I've got some help that I feel I can um, have a trusting and have an ongoing relationship, we can do this, and we can do this together. And that's a 
an awesome experience to be able to facilitate that conversation. I was just going to say context is everything. If you are working in an NGO and you are funded to do safety plans, that's what will get done. Um, so, you know, I guess I would therefore implore our policy makers to be careful what we fund um, because we might impose um, unintended harm. Kia ora. Kia ora, Gabrielle from Oranga Tamariki. I just wanted to ask a question around, um, because Bridget and Julia spoke a lot about engagement with the family and whanau and engage, working with the uh, non-abusive parent as well as the child and how effective that was. I was just wondering uh, whether there isn't that willingness or desire on the part of the family or the non-abusive parent to do that work with the child who is exposed to family violence. What is the best approach there? Is it to go further out into the community to other caregivers or peers? Or is there a, a different approach to help that child um, sort of, um, yeah, like deal with that family violence that they've been exposed to or experienced? Um, I'm really, um, the family group conference process in New Zealand is amazing. And the opportunity for um, the Fano to be all given the information, come together and have an opportunity to take the responsibility and come together with a plan to keep their f children safe is a really good process. I think there's room for improvement on how that's delivered currently, but that process is, uh, provides a real opportunity for responsibility, <coughs> for key information from social workers to be given to Fano, extended Fano about what's the issue here, what's the harm that's been caused and what needs to change, that's the bottom line, what has to change, and then handing over the, the, to the Fano the opportunity to come to a really good plan to address that harm. That's a real partnership between the state and Fano to keep children safe. And if the investment and the resource to enhance FGC to be what it was planned to be in the original legislation in terms of the investment of time to get everybody at that whānau hui with the information they need to make a good plan can be really, really successful. So uh, that brings together the opportunity for the family to sh um, pull together the resources and the strengths that they have within that family. One of the things we know is that um, carers who are struggling sometimes will um, not be sharing with the rest of the whānau what's going on because of shame. And if, as practitioners, we can work together to enhance that communication in a way that is respectful and acknowledges that parenting is a really hard card sometimes and that everybody in community needs help. And doing that in a res and undertaking those conversations in a really respectful way will have the best outcome for, for children. Um, yeah, from a research perspective, I think ideally non-abusive parent is where you'd go to for that stable relationship, but beyond that, some other caregiver, um, other whānau member, basically the child needs to know that there's someone there that is competent at caring for them, protecting them, um, that's the bottom line really. Hi, it's Ross again. I promise this is my last, my last time. <laughs> um, this is probably more a, a challenge or, or, um, to all of us um, more than anything. Um, in, in my work, I'm very um, client, child, child focused, young person focused in my work and work from a narrative base. There's been a lot of talk recently and it's been put into action through changes with, you know, in Oringham Tamariki you know, around the child's voice, the children's voice being so um, very important and it's been um, talked about this morning as well. And, um, but I, I guess the, the challenge for in that is that it's, it's okay and well, well to he, just have the, to hear the child's voice, but what do we do with it? And I think that's a huge challenge, and I think we need to be very careful that we don't get to a tokenistic place where oh, we've heard the child's voice, but that's it. And in my experience, getting the child's voice heard and doing something with it is quite a huge challenge, and there seems to be always lots of buts, and that bits from parents, bits from social workers, bits from other practitioners. So I think, you know, if, if we're going to be serious about hearing the child's voice, we also need to actually do something with it. 
I heard that the advocacy was not um, such an effective tool, but I think in terms of the child voice, we do need to have more advocacy around that. Um, that did come up, yeah, in the gaps that providers identified too as prioritising children's voice, particularly in government, was um, one place specifically mentioned. And I think that differs from advocacy a little bit, um, and we can probably yeah, separate those out to some extent, um, whereas I guess what I was meaning by advocacy is more the um, facilitating referrals and putting them in touch with different, rather than advocating for their voice as such, but yeah. Um, kia ora Ross. Um, I was just going to say, as the um, in incumbent um, CEO for an organisation um, called Voice, Whakarongo Mai, that's been um, set up to respond to, um, for, for children in care and promoting um, their voice, um, I guess what I wanted to open up us up to the opportunity of thinking about is there's advocacy where we as adults go and stand uh, for young people and, and rangatahi tamariki to, you, to try and say what we think that they've got to say. And the alternative opportunity is that we give them the platform and we give them the space to say what they have to say in their own words because we <laughs> as adults can only but just interpret and hope that we've got what they've got to say right. So, kia ora. Kia ora, and I'll share with you, um, I don't know if Justine from MOJ is still here, but um, Family Works is um, the NGO that delivers family mediation services, the out-of-court service for parents that are separating, and a project we've got running at the moment, which is funded by the Todd Foundation, is the child's voice and participation within family mediation. Um, so the process is that, obviously, both, both parents come together and make a plan about what where the, what the arrangements for the children are and young people going forward. And if they can't come up with an agreement, then it goes into the court and it becomes a judicial adversarial process that can take a long time. And the project that we've, um, is in, in pilot stage at the moment is looking about what's, what does a child's voice and child's participation look like in family mediation so that the child has a clear voice but hasn't got the responsibility and hasn't got both carers putting that responsibility on them. Um, and we're getting some really interesting practice initiatives and ideas coming through of different ways that children can share with their parents, carers, about that, what they want without that responsibility being theirs. So this, that's a really interesting project. Um, first of all, I uh, just want to recognise the absolute complexity and difficulty of the stuff you guys are all dealing with. This is really hard stuff. And uh, that moment of the door opening is a beautiful little moment. Um, I'm wondering in this, um, in a professional sense, because when talked about psychotherapy, there are lots of different types of things and lots of people doing lots of different stuff, some of which is very effective and some of which isn't. And uh, Sally, you mentioned that. Yep. Have you got a sense, or any of you have a sense, of how it can be managed in a professional way so that we're focusing on the good things that are working and are actually having those kind of conversations and mechanisms to address where they are not so well not so successful. You know, I think the real challenge for the sector is um, how do we put a monitoring process in, in place that enables us to be able to differentiate between good and bad. Um, if you think about the National Telephone Service, I'm sort of um, I have a role in directing this new. If you if you pick up the phone and you call a crisis team after hours now, um, what happens? All the staff's interactions with the community is recorded, and so you know we sit down and we have a template where we can look back and and, and see. The, you know, and with quite precise, in quite precise ways, what the nurse did well and what they didn't do well. Psychotherapy is um, such an important thing to do well, um, and with vulnerable families and vulnerable children, you know, the level of quality is what's really required. And, and you can do psychotherapy in lots of different ways. There are a lot of interventions, a lot of ways you can go about psychotherapy well, lots of interventions. Um, <laughs> But I guess self-efficacy is the end point. The end point is we should do a piece of work, whatever it, whatever it looks like. If it's good, then individuals and families benefit. You know, it, there's a value add, and you can measure that. And I think what's happening in the sector at the moment is we probably don't have enough of Bridget's time. Bridget should be looking over my shoulder and figuring out a methodology that tells me that what my group, of the people that I work with, how well are we doing what we do? And, and so maybe the tertiary sector has a really important, the tertiary university sector has a really important role to play in advancing this, 
so that we get better quality for, for what the taxpayers are paying for. And on, on a, um, another level, I think, uh, with the um, establishment of the Social Investment Agency, where analytics and research and evaluation is, is in, entrenched, obviously, in, line, um, in collaboration with Superu, um, into knowing that what we're investing in actually works, I, I think we're going to, we're only at the beginning of a journey. Uh, but we need to have good analytics and, uh, you know, we need to be using our IDIs, our big data, to, to understand what we're, that what we're investing in works and we know what works and we know why it works. Uh, at the moment, we're, we're really, you know, as a country, we're really lax and, you know, we, we, we take overseas information and we go, yes, let's transpose that over here and then we go, look, it works. Well, we don't, we don't actually know that it works, we just, you know, we're, we're hoping. Um, so we, ha we have an opportunity to know what works and why it works and how we can get it to work again in another, in another setting. Beautiful. I have a second question. Um, and again, n acknowledging that this is a pretty complex area, what my colleague Kirsten and I from Superu were talking about before is that a lot of the stuff we know you know, a lot of the stuff we've known for some time, and while our learning is always evolving and it always helps, some of it, you know, we know. Everyone in this room was nodding to a lot of things that you guys were all saying as you were presenting. So given that, the real question for us is, why haven't things moved further away from this faster? And so I'm interested, and I've got some sense of what you've said, but I'm interested as if you have the magic wand of the one thing that each of you would want done now, what would that be, please? <laughs> I, this is a little bit vague, <laughs> but I, I really think that we actually need to turn everything that we're currently doing on its head. I think that we've actually gotten the formula wrong, and if we keep doing what we've always done, we're only ever going to get what, we, what we've always got. Um, and what we've got right now, what the, the state of, of uh, where things are at for our, our tamariki, our rangatahi, our children here in Aotearoa is, is really not good enough. And I say this being born and bred living in South Auckland and knowing that in the last number of years things have got so much devastatingly worse. So that's not a very specific answer, but what I do know is that we're not, we're not getting it right and, and in no way are we at, um, at a good place. There are pockets of beauty and gold spots that we need to learn about, know about, understand it, analyse it, and then you know, work to repl replicate. Um, so I guess I'm not, I'm not saying get, all, get rid of everything, because there are absolute bright spots, but what we're doing right now is not good enough. Kia ora. I think from um, looking at it from an uh, NGO perspective, um, I think there's policy work and contracting work that currently, this is how funding is set up, the 10 hours, the units. Yes, there's been some movement into outcomes, but in terms of that unit cost, that hasn't changed. And I think that for creativity and for opportunities to invest more time into the development of interventions that seem to be having good outcomes so that we have a creative approach to how we fund services opposed to your 10 units so you've got to fit your services into that and to be quite honest if you're given 10 hours for historical generational violence trauma you're not even touching the surface Thanks, Yali. Um, if I was going to be really specific with my magic wand, I think it would be when we're funding ventures, evaluation funding needs to be added on. Not part of, not we want an evaluation to. He, here's the funding for the intervention and here's the funding for the evaluation. Because if you're not evaluating it, then it's actually not any good because how are you going to take it somewhere else? I'll get the final word. Um, I had an interesting experience. I had to go and see um, the only Tongan on death row in the United States of America. And I had to think very deeply. And we left 
the island as children, um, and I came this way and he went that way. And I think coming this way was better for me than going that way, can I say that? Um, and I had to think very, diff very, very deeply about the forces at work in both our lives that led us to very different places. Um, it's a really, really difficult question, the one that has been asked if we had a, a magic wand. But I really, truly believe that we have, we have within our society the capacity to care really well for children. And I think we understand the forces at work that produce a child that um, grows to fulfil their potential. And I think we understand the forces at work where a child doesn't do that. And I think that um, I don't have the answer. Yet I know the forces at work, uh, but I don't know how to translate that knowledge and understanding into the change that our country needs to make.